So Sunday saw The Whale, Brendan Fraser's new film. Now, Brendan Fraser is one of those actors for me who I don't know why, but I've always loved. Even even when I didn't necessarily know he was capable of really good acting. And even if he wasn't in particularly good films a lot of the time, like George of the Jungle, I love that because I saw it as a kid, but you know, it's not like something you'd call a classic. The Mummy is brilliant, obviously. But beyond that, like there's just something about him. He has some charisma and likability where he's just great. And he just disappeared off the face of the planet for 15 years. And then I remember reading this article a while back. He was making like a mini comeback. His first thing really back in in that whole time. And he was just voicing this character that was a robot on some show. It's supposed to be pretty good actually. But he got into why he wasn't around for so long. And it was because he got sexually assaulted supposedly by some movie producer. Which with all that Me Too stuff. I don't really think of dude on dude but i mean that must happen all the time as well terry cruz actually you know that huge geezer from uh, brooklyn 999 he actually had it happen to him but anyway that's why brendan fraser was out of the loop and out of hollywood for so many years and this has kind of been considered his comeback even though he has actually been back in films for a little while i didn't actually know anything about this film i i'd managed to avoid everything to the extent that i didn't even know until the day before i was seeing it it was about him being fat. I knew that. I hadn't seen anything. Sophie let it slip the day before. Yeah. And I was kind of pissed. Cause, and th- that nearly sort of threw me off as well. Because going in, I was like, wait, so this is called The Whale. I'm assuming it's about, it's calling him The Whale. And it's about him being a fat guy. And I was a bit like, oh, I don't know about this actually now. She also told me that all the weight gain was his is real, which is not, by the way. Because no. <laughs> he he did gain a lot of weight, but it's mostly a fat suit because he's supposed to weigh like eight hundred pounds in this. So you get in there, sit down, we're in the King's Cross. Every man in that little, you know, the little one yeah. on the corner where it's, where you feel like you're in someone's living room. Sat down, only about maybe five or six people in there. Is that it? Yeah, it wasn't sold. I mean, it's never. I mean, that only holds like maybe thirty people. Mm. Probably less actually. Probably like ten, twenty people. But yeah, it wasn't sold out. Sat down, and started watching, and it is unbelievable just unbelievable and i'm not really going to go into hard spoilers or maybe i end up will going into spoilers and if i do i'll try and warn you potential spoiler spoilers but it is mesmerizing how good it is and it's getting i was shocked to see a lot of the criticism it's getting or i should say probably actually i wasn't that shocked a lot of critics are slating it some are slating it just because you know they think it's unsubtle and and melodramatic other people are slating it for the you know the stupid sort of predictable stuff of like it's fatophobic and all this nonsense but actually one thing i was surprised was i feel like a lot of even the people giving it good reviews are partly missing a lot of the brilliance of it you haven't seen it actually i can't remember i just forgot no because i don't want to spoil it for you either yeah yeah it's a difficult one i have to talk about this properly at some point in the show so we'll next time we do it this week in film You'll have watched it, assumedly. If you haven't yeah, by that I, point, I'm, I'm going to try and watch it on Sunday. Okay, we'll do it properly then, next time. Ah, oh, it's really not. I really want to talk about it. All right, let me put it this way. Let me In a way that I can skirt around it, then we'll just move on. Uh, I feel like a lot of the way people are criticising it, or, or even when they're giving it good reviews, they're talking as if it's the greatest Hallmark movie ever. In the sense that it has its flaws and that it's, you know, it's a bit too simple in its message and a little bit, on the nose of things but the acting is so fantastic across the board and the directing so well done and competent that it is still a five-star film amazing this that and the other for me i actually feel like it's the opposite it is not clear who is the hero it's not clear who is the villain and it's a lot deeper in how it explores the issues in that are at play and there's no one like it's not about brendan fraser is this man that has this problem it's about look at all these people that have these essentially the same problems manifesting in completely different ways okay this won't be a spoiler so i'm able to ask this question there's been a lot of talk about brendan fraser possibly winning an oscar for this my question is or i was wondering actually were they just saying that nomination out of sympathy for him? Or do you think after watching a film, if he did win an Oscar, it would be deserved? Oscars for some reason, actually not for some reason, it makes sense, but they just love 
a body transformation. Like when someone, like when Charlie's Theron got all ugly for Monster, they loved it. When someone gets fat, they love it or puts on weight. And he got really, really fat for this role before even the fat suit went on. But even on, without that, it is phenomenal. Like it is unbelievable and you know they'll show on the trailers the big emotional bits where he's crying and all that shit but it's the little things in between all that the little nuances of his character the little subtle things on his expression and, and subtle like little interchanges with other characters that tells you everything about their relationship with just one shot he is fucking phenomenal but everyone in it is phenomenal he just is gonna take center stage because He's been a he's been in the wilderness. Oh, he's it's the main comeback. He's the main character, yeah. and it's he's playing a big fat guy, and like, you know, mm. loads of reasons why. I feel like the Oscars as well. You're right about the body transformation and stuff, but they always a film always wins an Oscar on on a subject basis. Like was mm. it Mo- was it Moonlight about the the gay relationship one one yeah. Twelve Years a Slave mm. one one. For example, if hypothetically because this did happen wolf of wall street was up against the well the well was gonna win the best picture oscar 9.9 times out of 10 mm. yeah i mean there's a thing as well like fun movies don't get considered even yeah uh, i mean there's a reason they have a term like oscar bait this isn't oscar bait like i, I couldn't imagine alfonso curran making oscar bait in the sense of not even that he wouldn't try to or that he wouldn't try to but i mean in the sense that his films are blunt and horrible like they're not nice experiences and they're not like this is is not i like i don't not spoiling it but you'd probably expect but there's not a this isn't a life affirming film where everything works out like it is bleak and it's kind of again I'm like skirting on the territory of spoiler but last thing i'll say on it is it is the more I actually think about it and think about at least what I think it was really about and trying to say, the bleaker it gets, and therefore it's not going to win it. Like, he'll it. win for acting, but he, they won't win for director or film or anything like that. Can I do? It was it Alfonso Cuarón or Darren Afron Senki? Because didn't he direct Requiem for a Dream? This guy. Yeah, shit. Sure. Did I say I said the wrong Alfonso Cuarón? That's why it's cool. Oh, it doesn't matter. But yeah, like, he directed, obviously, Requiem for a Dream, which is probably one of the bleakest films mm. I've ever watched in it. Everyone, like, rants and raves about it. I've seen it once or twice. No, twice, actually. I remember how many times I have seen it. I wish, like, it's a good film, but I always struggle to get through it. It's like, when can you ever be in the mood for that film? Like, if you're yeah. happy, it will just make you be like, oh, if you're sad, it will just put you into a spiral of depression. Right? Yeah, it's one of those films yeah. where it had kind of a couple of iconic moments of your friends would tell you about, like, oh, you've got to see that mm. scene. It was one of those films where you, kind of like when we talked about Bone Tomahawk, it's it's nearly a film that people tell you about, you've got to see a certain scene rather than the film itself, involving a double-sided dildo, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a great film, but I know what you mean, where... Not like when would you be in the mood to watch that? This was for me at least really entertaining. I, I want to revisit it again. I want to go see it again. Like it, it passed by very quickly. There was no part of me that was like, "This is dragging." There's no bit where I was conscious I was watching a film. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just passing by, and I was actually gutted when it ended because yeah. I was a bit like, because it ends quite sharply. And I was just, I wanted, I just wanted more film. You know, and sometimes you have that, like, Dancers with Wolves. It's like three hours long, but somehow I always want more film. And sometimes it's 90 minutes and you're, you can feel it dragging. Yeah, yeah. Where, even though it's such a shorter film. I saw a film the other day. I've just resubscribed to Now TV, not to mm. the sports, to the movies. Because I wanted to watch Last of Us. Oh, yeah. I guess I could just record it on my Skybox downstairs. But it's kind of in the living room and people are always in there. And I like to be like yeah. in my own company when I watch stuff like that. But I want to touch on The Last of Us later a bit separately. I know it's technically TV, but I just wanted to discuss it. Um, it's called The Station Agent. 
And it was just on like, you know, you know when you're on Now TV and there's like all like hidden gems and all this shit. Mm. So I was like, I'll check in there and I'll see what's in there. And it's basically got the guy, um, Peter Dinklage, who's, you know, in Game of Thrones is his most famous mm. role, the little guy. <laughs> Incidentally, have you ever seen his Indian uh, doppelganger? Uh, no, I haven't actually. I'll show it to you after, it's crazy. And I think technically the Indian guy's not a dwarf. He's just short and has a huge oh, really? head. Wow. <laughs> anyway, I'll go. have to check that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen. <laughs> Looks exactly like um, it. Now this goes, this is one of those films that falls into the genre that we've discussed many times on this show. And I'm yet to kind of get a name for it yet. One of those films where nothing really happens. But it's still a good film, like Patterson. Slice of Life film. Yeah, like After Sun, like, mm. even though stuff does happen in it. Essentially what it is, is he's a train enthusiast and he works in his friend's shop in a, in a model railway shop. You know, like the model railways, mm. like people love shit like that. Like, Do you know what? In another life, I actually think I could enjoy that. Yeah, it's, it's very therapeutic. I um, remember like painting a little Lord of the Rings toy when I was a little kid and there's something about it that's just... Like, it is just relaxing or, like, making a... Yeah, 100%. Like, ...model thing. It, it's like, to get away from, like, the, the modern technology and just be out there to, like, reflect will, mm. will probably be good. Like, we can't do it here, but where it's set in, like, the country in yeah. America. Anyway, his friend passes away. He finds out that in his will, his friend has a, like, abandoned, abandoned station that he's just left in. So he goes there and, you know... He's working on it, repairing them, trying to, like, repair all the, like, the train carriages. Don't forget, he's got disadvantages. Mm. Right. And what it really is, is him just meet, like, he's very insular. He just goes around by himself, doesn't want company. And, you know, he slowly gets out of his shell and we meet this end, cast of characters who try and befriend him. Like, he's always going on for walks. Can I come for a walk with you, blah, blah, blah. Again, nothing really happens, but it was just kind of like a very... For like, it's one of those films where you've had a tough day and you'll watch it and you'll think, oh, I feel a lot better about myself. Mm. Is it worth... I was thinking of doing a whole episode on it, but on reflection, I don't think it merits that. But I would say, like, if you want a serotonin boost, it's a, it's a great film to watch. It, 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 it really is quite good. And he seems to have a very good effect with the ladies in this. They love him. So. Oh, do you know what's funny? I was <laughs> just about to ask, yeah, yeah. does he get... Because I got a picture of what the kind of film it's going to be, and I don't want to know everything before I watch mm -hmm. it, obviously, but is it dark comedy? Is it just light and fluffy? Um... I'd say the bits of comedy are a bit darker. Yeah, yeah, it's not fluffy. Like mm. there is incidents where, well, like an incident where he's walking along and a bunch of kids like start taking the piss out of him. Like it, it's dark. It's it's it's. And that's the funny bit. It, it's funny the way it happens. Yeah, yeah. Is it, it meant to be funny? Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's that kind of comedy. Like it, mm. it's 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 good, but it's more dark comedy, but more about his perspective on life and how. He him by letting people in, his life kind of changes. So. That's amazing. Do you know what's funny when you think of Peter Dinklage? How many dwarf roles can there be at any one time? Does he just have it sewn up for the next twenty years? You say that, but Warwick Davis used to be cast in every single dwarf role there is. Yeah, but now he's not. Yeah, now he's Mitch, not. Yeah. He can get the e much. He can get the much rarer old. True. Old dwarf, but it does. It, I mean, does that even exist? Could they not just make Peter Dinklage look a bit older? Yeah, that's true. I mean, the only other like the only other like disabled actor I can remember actually is that guy from Breaking Bad. He was genuinely. And insane. when have you ever seen him in anything? Yeah, else? yeah, like you've like, never he, seen him done. in anything else. Like, yeah. But like, what, what, like, what, you, what do you do if you're the second best dwarf actor in the world right now? Yeah, that's so true. Or do you hope Peter Dinklage gets oversaturated? And ruins yeah, his it? career because I've seen him like they kind of been putting him in too much. Oh, hundred now. They've been inserting him into things where it's not necessary that the characters are dwarf, which sounds like a good thing because it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because sometimes you do think that when you watch stuff is is like why is like in this entire cast no one's disabled? 
and I don't mean like maybe if you went by head of population percentage of how many people are disabled, maybe that's accurate. I don't know. It's, sometimes it feels like it'd be good to get to a point where a character could just be in a wheelchair or something, and it not be pertinent to the point plot, and it not take no, away. No, I understand but, you. But do you know what I mean? But if it, yeah. I, there's part of me, like I feel like you, or if you if you watch a movie like that and someone's just in crutches but it's not pertinent to his character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of you will always be like, why have they done that? Yeah, no. Nah. It's like when Nicolas Cage gave himself Tourette's for no reason as a choice up for his own actor, for his own character in Tin Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And part you just, something about, like maybe most people don't, but when I'm watching it, I'm just thinking, this is just obnoxious. Like, yeah, your, yeah. your character doesn't need Tourette's. Yeah, yeah, But why yeah. does they need to have it? Like, what, like you, no one needs anything in a movie, technically. But who would actually... If you haven't got experience with being disabled, it's very hard for like a writer to be like, do you know what? I'm going to write a film about a disabled person. <laughs> like, mm. do you know? And then pitch it. Because everyone's going to be like, but where do you get this from? Like, <laughs> Have especially, you seen someone? Or? Especially nowadays. But then also... First of all, it's like, well, I want to write something about Tarzan. Like, do I have to yeah, go exactly. live in a jungle? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, maybe being a method writer and a method director is a good thing. Maybe that would produce more work. But also, I suppose on the other end, like the modern kind of woke way of looking at it would be, you know, you should give a, a dwarf director the opportunity. It's yeah, like, yeah, How many yeah, of them yeah. are there? Yeah. And they'd say, well, maybe they'd say, well, that's because they don't get the opportunities. And there probably is truth to that, but then also probably the pool of dwarf directors is going to be so much smaller than, <laughs> like, of not dwarf directors. And, like, yeah. how do you find someone? Why don't you just let the person that wants to tell the story try? And if they happen to be a dwarf, great. And if they happen to not be, then give them a shot. And maybe they'll get it right. Yeah, I'm just thinking in my head, um, who are the most dis- famous disabled characters on the screen i've got three really okay uh, so that deaf lady who was in the west wing yeah who played joey joey <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> joey. yeah i always fancy i want to see if you can name any of the three that i've got in my head all right geezer from breaking bad that i've said yeah that wasn't one of them but okay uh, okay so i'm assuming peter dinklage also isn't one of them no okay warwick davis also isn't one of them no okay so technically we actually got Four just there. Yeah. Do you want the list? So Joey from the West Wing was one. No, I was just agreeing with you about Oh, okay. So I've got none of them. All right. What's your list? The list is Daniel Day-Lewis from My Left Foot. Oh, fuck. I did... I thought... I clearly thought you were saying something else. Uh, no. I did mean, you not as notice in... from my... Yeah, the yeah, things yeah. I was listing up? Yeah, but I mean as in like playing the same Yeah, thing. no, I know that now. All oh, right. <laughs> but didn't you not uh, think when no, I was no, listing up... I was just up... letting you do it. Oh, okay. The second one... <laughs> the second one was... I forgot his fucking name now. The uh, guy in uh, Forrest Gump. Lieutenant Dan. Oh, his okay. His legs get blown off. What about Forrest Gump is himself? Oh, yeah. Forrest Are you thinking Gump just is... physically? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the third one... I love you said Forrest Gump, and then you forgot about Forrest Gump. The third one was... Um, hey, you guys from the Goonies. <laughs> What? Because he technically... I guess Slough is technically... Yeah, he's disabled. Like, yeah, on, I just man. didn't think of him as disabled. But yeah, I guess... But other than that, that was that was it, really. Slough. <laughs> no, he is disabled, though, man. I know, but the other, the other two you said were so grounded, and then you went yeah, to Slough. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the only one I could think of. Um, um, you blow my mind with Slough. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what? Slough, actually... I'm sure there's more. <laughs> One of the most iconic and lovable ones. Yeah, yeah, he definitely That's is. another thing that you just made me think of as well, where I, one of the best things about Sloth as a character is it goes against that, that classic thing in fiction of any kind, like going back to the fucking Middle Ages probably, that if someone's disfigured, they're evil. You know that whole notion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so fucked up when you think about it. Because in all actual reality, when someone's disfigured, it just means they've either had a horrendous accident or they were born that way. 
and when like when have they ever been eat like when has that ever come up whenever has it ever said serial killer ted bundy today you know he ends up looking like a movie star not a fucking yeah kid. like that is so fucked up that on top of already looking that way and having that unfortunate everyone's like you evil bastard yeah there's that whole not and i guess it's probably like a primitive evolutionary thing where you know, it's like when that uncanny valley where someone's eyes are too close or too far apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just unsettles you, and it's probably a genetic thing of your body, your mind being repulsed and saying, "Don't mate," because that's bad genetics. But sometimes, like, but it's just fucked up. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. like, what do you call them? Disfigured or deformed? I mean, it's so, either or, isn't it? Sometimes they're like worshipped as gods. So there was like this guy that had like loads of groves in like he was like the elephant man of mm. India and obviously they worship Ganesh, the elephant god, and he was like seen as a reincarnation of Ganesh. And he like got put into like mansions and shit. And he had elephantitis. Yeah. But but you don't look like an elephant. No, but he had like a growth that looked a bit like a trunk. Oh, so he he was the first elephantitis person that actually accidentally did kind yeah, of look like yeah, an elephant yeah well i mean i get it when they're born with more than one limb yeah i mean that's really nice actually like you'd rather be born in one of those <laughs> yeah, yeah, where yeah, you kind yeah. of you kind of like at least worshipped in some way or yeah. can make a decent living so first thing i want to talk well next thing i want to talk about sorry is i'm doing this weird thing where my weekends haven't been too free i've been doing various stuff but mm. i've decided that when I have a free weekend, whenever that is, and it's very rare, so this is why I want to do it, I'm going to do a trilogy every weekend. So, on the Friday, I shall watch the first film. On the Saturday, I shall watch the second film. And on the Sunday, I shall watch the third. I think it's a pretty cool way to spend your weekend. That is a weekend. great idea. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's a cool way to spend your weekend. No, well, I, think I it, like it. I think I it like screams, it. like, lonely. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> but it's definitely... I like from a film blues of Oh, yeah, you, yeah. I think from, it's great. That's the point of this podcast, so... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, I, I do, think it's good. I do have friends. Um, so I started <laughs> it off with... <laughs> I started it off with... I kicked it off a couple weekends back with the Nolan Batman trilogy. Mm. I decided to do that actually. So I started off on a Friday with Batman Begins, Dark Knight. And on the Sunday it was Dark Knight Rises, but that did take me a while to get through because I forgot it was like three hours long mm. and shit kept happening. I had to keep pausing it. But yeah, like, I'm just going to do that. So I might do like Back to the Future. I was thinking maybe doing the original Indiana Jones, you know, like Raiders. Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, yeah. but I won't do any of the newer ones because they're shit. Well, there's only one newer one that's actually out, and one newer one that's about to drop. Oh, kind of excited. I saw the trailer for it in the new oh, when yeah. I was watching the whale. It got me pumped. It got me buzzing for it. You know, interesting they're going with the chick from Fleabag. Uh, yeah, Phoebe Waller Bridge. But you know the way. I haven't seen much of it. Obviously, it's going to be loads of action, but I, they're not trying to. It looks like they're not going to try and make him physically do things as if he was Harrison Ford from back in the day. Yeah, I you know, think, uh, like the Irishman, where eight-year-old Robert De Niro is like doing that old man kick, beating someone up. <laughs> yeah, it looked, it looked, it looked okay. It looked, it looked more. Indiana Jones. Do you know what I think about Indiana Jones 4 for me was the execution was horrible, but I actually loved the idea of, because they would have been 20, you know, the actors were 20 years older. So if you timed it up from when the plot was taking place, it would have been the 60s. And that replacing the religious, uh, spiritual, occult aspect of it with the sci-fi supernatural aspect of it that would have been like big in the 60s and whole you know fear of red communism and fear of the bomb and all that was genius but it just was shit like the execution was fucking shite right from the get-go like the they didn't even have a little opening mini adventure which is like the most indiana jones thing ever it just went straight into it is this kingdom of the Crystal, what's yeah. it? What's Crystal it? Skull. Yeah, because in it he just like there's a bomb going off and he hides in a fridge, and you're like, 
Ah, oh, where's the boulders and shit? See, I disagree. Well, like, uh-huh. I, for me, I even love that sequence. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Se- and I feel like if you drop that whole set piece into a good Indiana Jones film, you, no one would complain about that bit, but it's because that is in a bad Indiana Jones film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone hates that sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rewatching a Bat Nolan trilogy again. Like, still, when was they released? Like, years ago now. Like, 2011 was when The Dark Knight was released. Rises. Oh, Dark Knight. Oh, the No, I'm wrong, one. actually. Sorry, it was Do- Dark Knight Rises was... I think Batman Gins was 2007. It was 2012. Yeah. No, so, was it 2007? Yeah. So it's like well, then, Okay, ago. so, sorry. Um, Dark Knight Rises was 2011. Yeah, but I always said The Dark... Uh, the Dark Knight was the best one. And I wasn't really sure about The Dark Knight Rises, but on rewatch, it is a really good film, actually. Yeah, I want to check yeah. it out, because I've, I've, I only ever watched it once in the cinemas. Oh, it was good. And like we said last week for Spirit Away, now that I know the film, mm. and I kind of can get, like, I, I, I have the disappointment of it wasn't the film I wanted it to be. Now I can just watch it as it is, and hopefully it's better. Batman Begins is a lot of people's favourites. And a lot of people actually... I don't know if they're trying to just have the hipster opinion, but a lot of people actually rate it even above like it, yeah. Dark Knight Rises. Uh, or The Dark Knight, sorry. Uh, but watching it again, I rewatched it a while back, not too long ago, and it is fucking fantastic. It is, yeah, great. Such yeah. a different feel from the second film. And it's funny where tonally and styling, I feel like when you think of that trilogy, you think of The Dark Knight. But that's actually the odd one out. The first one and the second, the first one and the third one, are really similar in tone, pacing, style. Yeah, it's like you know the Back to the Future trilogy. Mm. Everyone always pans the third one, but I like the third one. I love the third. Yeah, one. yeah, like I love yeah. it. Yeah, it's one of those films where you're like, why? It's like the rule that you have to hate it, and I just like I love the third. One. The third one's great. See, this is the great debate about trilogies, you know, because mm. everyone always has their favourite, but it might not be necessarily the same as the others. Like, for some reason, like, obviously, I'm going back to Indiana Jones, like, Raiders is just a cut above the other two. But I actually prefer The Last Crusade to Temple of Doom. I don't like Temple of Doom that much. See, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong here, because my, I always thought, Temple of Doom was the one everyone hated. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> I don't like I it. I fucking love Temple yeah. of Doom. I think it's great. And do you know what's funny as well? Temple of Doom was the film that fucked Spielberg in the head about being violent. Yeah. Because he got... So, that was kind of before there was properly ratings and stuff. And I think it was a big part of what brought in maybe the PG-13 yeah. rating or one of them. But it got so much flack for how violent and messy it is which is one of the best things about it like one of the big things that's grilled into my eyeballs from a young age was that you know where all the guys are falling off the wooden bridge and you just see all the all the crocodiles are like doing their death rolls and you just see turbans getting mixed in with (laughs) blood and i was like oh my god but that fucked him in the head to the point where he always avoided violence in his films after that like on-screen graphic violence. Obviously, some of his films would get 18s, you know, Schindler's List and stuff, but it wasn't... He didn't go at it in the same way. Yeah, yeah. But I agree with you. Last Crusade, a lot of people hate that as well. I love Last Crusade. Mate, you, you've got him knocking around with Sean yeah, Connery exactly. as his dad, doing the fucking sully... Uh, yeah, yeah. Putting flocks of birds yeah, yeah, into yeah, yeah, airplane yeah. propellers and all... And then, like, like he, like, squirts someone in the eye with, like, a pen... And then they like crash the tank and he's like, they always say the pen's mightier than the sword. And like, is that a quip at James Bond? Like, kind of joke. But I was watching Temple of Doom the other day. You know, it's always on on like fucking ITV2 at like 7pm on a Saturday. That or Ice Age. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Or Ice Age is constantly on. We were just watching it and my mum was like, there was the bridge scene actually. She's like, oh, this is horrible. Like, my dad was like, no, they're going to get eaten by the crocodiles. And she was like, this is horrible, Colin. Like, and I was like, it's not even that bad. I love when they're doing the the sacrificial ceremony and taking that guy's heart oh, out. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a couple more I wanted to check. And the little Asian geezer. What's he called again? Short Round. Yeah, he was 
brilliant. He's man. in everywhere all at once. Everywhere. I everything. need to see that. Seen it. Great film. Nearly sat down to watch it yesterday. I won't talk about that because you didn't talk about it well. So yeah. the truce is on. But there's a couple other ones I got my eye on. They seem to come out on the streaming service really quickly now. Like mm. we've discussed it before, but I'm not against it. I wanted to see that Belfast. I don't know if you caught it. Cracking movie. Is it like just like a? It's not a musical, is it? Nah, not even All right, remotely. Good. <laughs> Although saying that. The entire soundtrack is provided by Van der Man, Van Morrison. Oh, really? Obviously, he grew up in Belfast, and every single song used in the film is a Van Morrison tune, which, you know, we fucking love Van Morrison, love so Van no problem Morrison, with that. Van der Man. So he kind of, he does set, he nearly feels like a, uh, another character in the film, but it's not a musical. It's not a complete bummer either. It's nicely in between. It's is I'd say it even leans towards being funnier than it is sad. What's the story? Like they're trying to Belfast troubles. Growing up in it's not a story, it's a setting. It's just growing up in Belfast during the troubles. So does it fall into the slice of life category? No. Okay. Not in terms of what we actually like what when I say to you slice of life and we're talking about that sort of film, no. Okay. Arguably it is because it just follows these people's lives. It's not I guess there's a plot, but there's not really a plot. Okay. It's mostly autobiographical. A little bit auti autobiographical. Yeah. Another yeah, another one. We've talked about the best films of two thousand and twenty two, mm. but we never talked about the worst films of twenty twenty two. Oh that's a good one actually. And um I saw it flash up on Disney Plus actually, um, and it brought back shocking memories. Um, it was the fucking Amsterdam, Is you know, the man? one with Christian Bell and like Denzel Washington's son, and fucking Taylor Swift turns up for like 10 seconds. Uh, Anna Taylor Joy's in it pointlessly, Rami Manek's in it pointlessly. It, I was just sitting there with my friend from work, Jason, and like. You know when you're watching a film like with someone and you're just sitting there watching it, I had this inner voice inside my head. He was like there, and I was like, "This is so shit!" <laughs> like literally, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't know whether he was like enjoying it. And then like an hour and a half in, he just like I just felt him tap me, and he was like, "Shall we go? This is so bad." I was like, "Thank God you said it." It, it was fucking shit that is such a shame because when you look you know when you look at a a cast that good and it's a waste of all their time i always think i wonder how many like budding directors will never get their career now like you think about the amount of people that you know christian bell was like okay yeah i've got a month here where i'm not doing anything I'll, i'll i'll go shoot your little indie movie for two weeks and then that guy ends up it's a hit and he ends up having an amazing career yeah uh, or someone else, and it never happened, just because they were all wrapped up doing that hunk of shit, yeah. which I haven't actually seen. I might like it, you never know. But I don't think you will. But that's uh, the good thing about films is it's up to interpretation. Mm. So I actually watched something that we discussed at length before as well, but never got a chance to see it in the cinema for whatever reason. Again, it came on Amazon Prime. Not complaining. Licorice Pizza. Oh. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is slice of life. Yeah, it is. I was just about to say that. <laughs> Surely, like it is in a. There's something. It, it's nearly like it has to be a subgenre of slice of life. You know the way you'd be like, it's a horror comedy. This is a slice of life romance, quirky something. Like I don't know what it is, but it's got some other flavor ingredient going on in it. Do you know? I like. I don't mean to be crass here, but. I found that girl very attractive, man, that he's chasing after. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah, I did may- not at all. Really? <laughs> I mean, she's not. She's perfect. Maybe it's... No, good. actually, I don't know why I'm trying to be polite. She's never going to hear this. No, just no. Maybe it's because she was, like, the unattainable object for his chasing. Do you know what I mean? But Yeah, I just loved the, I just loved the fact that you never really knew where you were going with it and it never really mattered. Do you know what and I it felt like everyone was enjoying it and having fun with it. Yeah, I really like the way, the funny bits in it, the way they like worked in about him pretending he was Jewish and mm. shit like that. that. That was fucking quite funny. Like, it was just Paul Thomas Anderson. I feel like for a while, I actually loved The Master and I love 
uh, th- uh, there will be blood. Actually, I haven't even seen Phantom Fred, but there was something about that period where he was making films where it felt like he felt like he needed to make really weird, dark movies that didn't necessarily, that felt ambiguous in order to be taken seriously in that top tier of act, of directors. Do you know what I mean? That's probably me completely just self-projecting, but it just... Like, he made Boogie Nights, he made Magnolia. Very, like, just incredible films. But very accessible, very linear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly he just starts making these really bizarre, dark, ambiguous films. And one of the things he really can do better than almost arguably anyone ever is get incredible performances. This looks like... This was finally a film again where he still... It's ambiguous and it's weird, but it feels like he was having fun with it again. And it just, it was a, it was a cool, interesting movie, but it was also really fun and really digestible. Like it didn't, it didn't feel like a slog to get through. Yeah. My biggest compliment to him, there's only certain directors that I just want to watch their films, no matter what the critics say, just to check them out. I can name two of them. I always watch every single Wes Anderson film, no matter what. I didn't like the French... French Dispatch. I gave it a go. I didn't... Hmm. Wes Anderson films are very like... Hmm. Well, let me let me ask you this. Yeah. Have you ever liked an anthology film? It's a good question. They all suck. Name all... some. I mean, there's... Crash. Not... No, that's not an anthology right. film. Um, that's an intersecting lives film. All right, cool. Anthology film where it's like, here's a story, here's a story, here is the story. It, you used to get quite a lot of horror ones. You probably still do to okay. an extent. They all, they, anyone you've ever seen, they all stink. They're yeah, terrible. I actually did go through Wes Anderson's whole catalogue for some reason. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I thought of that fucking Darjeeling Express. Oh, I really liked that. I liked it. But it was I take the one no one life. ever talks about. What did you think of Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou? I, 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 I liked it. I feel like that is maybe his best film that it. no one ever talks about. Yeah, it was very surreal, but it was perfect for him, like the settings. It's got... Like, there's always a part in his films that have that kind of nearly, like, dreamlike yeah, s- yeah. sequence or, or period. But this was, it's like he took that style and applied it to an entire movie. Like the whole film just kind of drifts along in this weird way. Yeah, an undersea, like an underwater setting is like perfect for him because it's very ethereal. Like, do you know what I mean? But then, like, the actual special effects with the sharks are these really, like, kids TV show style puppets. But it just works for some reason. I don't know why. I think it was based on like this real like diver guy. I've watched a document. I can't remember his name for the life of me. But he had a very interesting life. I haven't actually seen saying that. I still haven't seen Bottle Rocket. Because I just couldn't find it to stream. So I'll try and find a stream for you. It is Bottle Rocket's great. Okay. And do you know what? It's actually amazing where. You know the way. Like even some of our favourite directors ever, who you feel like have such a distinct style. But if you watch their first films, it's not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His style was there from the get-go. The only things that are noticeable is how the budget limitations affect it, but it's there. Like It's just 100%. It, it arrived in his first debut, no-budget film, fully formed. Yeah, and um, back to my other point about Paul Thomas Anderson is... Whatever project he brings out, I'll just watch it because it's not going to be shit shit, is it? Is it might not be as good as some other films, but you know, he's all he's always kind of reliable with his outputs. Because but then again, it's it's pretty unreliable whether you'll like it or not, but it will always be amazing. Yeah, if that makes sense. Didn't he make the? Was it him that made the one with? Um, Joaquin Phoenix as a detective Inherent Vice yeah. only one I didn't like but I only yeah, saw I it once I and like I feel it. like that might again be in the category of give it another go because now you know what it is yeah I didn't like that one so maybe that's mm. just destroyed my whole point but I actually watched um, have you ever seen Juno? 
Yeah, Juno's pretty good. I thought it was fucking Wes Anderson for ages. Like, it was a very kooky film. Like. Yeah, it, it, that was one of those. That I feel like that was one of the first films in that trend where the Oscars try and be different. Yeah, because that was that, I remember that one first screenplay and that was a big shock. Because not that it wasn't a good screenplay, it was very good screenplay, but those sort of films just don't win Oscars. And then Silver Lining play, but and I feel like the Oscars try and go out of their way um, to not give it to the obvious one, like you know, and they want to have a lot of first, like the first, uh, yeah, first film about mental health, uh, Silver Linings, maybe. yeah, and first foreign film that won it, and first you know whatever. So, and and do you know what? That's not the worst thing because I, I, I get that you don't want to politicize the message, we don't politicize the reasoning behind it, but. I mean, the 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 people that choose best films and stuff for the Oscars literally don't even watch the films. Really? No, most of the time they don't watch the films. So how's that work? Because they cunts. It's because fu- it's stupid. What do they do? Word of mouth. I think they like get a scene or something, or they they get an idea. Like they obviously some of them maybe have just watched it because they went and watched it like a normal person, but it's not required, so they don't even watch them. So the fact that, but the fact that it's getting politicized and they're actively trying to give it to the kind of films they didn't before, honestly, that's one of the few times I actually say, yeah, don't do it by merit then, because you're already not doing it by merit. So yeah. why not give it yeah. to something a bit different? Um. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know if I've ever. Well, I don't know. I do. I, I, I've been pretty vocal about. I do read reviews before I see films. But you don't care if they're bad. But you kind of just know if a film shit. I can't, yeah. I can't really explain it. See, so it's like how I, you hate Mark Mode, and I disagree with almost all his takes on films. But I still used to uh, used to enjoy listening to him. And I would listen to a review, and sometimes he'd give a good review, and I'd be like, and I could know oh, I would like that. And sometimes he could give a terrible review of the film, saying it's terrible, and. I could just knowing what he thought about films enough. I know I knew when you I disagree. wouldn't like it yeah. or would love it, irrespective of like how he hated it or trashed it or said it was good. The only thing, the only thing I use because you know it's not about critical reviews. You're right; it's about your interpretation as a film goer. But I do kind of use reviews as a yardstick because simply because. It's not about a money Declan or anything like that because we have our membership or whatever. Or, although we do pay for it, but it's not like as much as going. It's just time. Mm. Like I, I hate like I hate wasting like three hours. You know when you walk out and you're like that was so shit and it's really infuriating. Oh, it's horrible. It's yeah. that same feeling like you know when you don't mind doing some work. But if it gets deleted and you have to do that same work yeah. again, it feels like ten times as hard. And it's that thing where it's like you stole my time. It's why you. Yeah. It's why people get angry. Yeah, yeah. Where, like if you listen to a bad song, it's just like that was three minutes. Yeah, the thing is, the way. thing is, Declan, you'll never get it back. No, you'll never get it back. But it's also, it's not just like you didn't take two hours from me. You took. You took what? my soul. You t- yeah, <laughs> and I like you. Even if it doesn't take that long to decide to make watch a film it's like there's the build up there's the after it is there's the like i could have been doing something else it was like i had five hours before i had to fall asleep and now i'm getting up for yeah work. yeah yeah it's, fuck you but man. we never we've never really had a film that's been universally bad but it's achieved like cult classic like the room like do you know what i mean you go well, into it, you go into it thinking this is shit but i want to watch it because it's meant to be hilarious and shit I can't think of any. No, there. I mean, well, there's one called Samurai Cop that I want you to see. I mean, I mean, as in we've watched them, but like in the cinema, ever in the cinema. Ah, uh, well, no, I mean, when films are that bad, you don't, they don't make it to a cinema. Yeah, yeah, not now. Not near not you. Now. The only way you end up seeing it in the cinema is if you literally knew the dickhead who made it. Yeah, and yeah, he's like, yeah. oh, I rented a cinema to yeah, show it yeah, once. Yeah. Which yeah. is what Tommy was I done. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Tommy we, Wise. We did it for months yeah, with that billboard. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other director I've, I've got into as well, I've been watching a, his newer work has got a lot of publicity, but I've actually been going back to his old back catalogue, mm. is no, Noah Bama book. Oh, yeah. Um, because funny Squid enough, and the Whale? Yes. Yeah. Funny enough, 
that is what the, the first film that I saw. And I really liked that, actually. That was really, really good. But I never saw, like, I knew Marriage Story had won Oscars and stuff. But I scrolled over it and I was like, this just looks a bit depressing, so I'll just give it a miss. But I did watch it. It was a good film as well. I like no, They're a bit... It's kind of films I like because it's a bit kooky as well. How good is Laura Dern in that? In Marriage Story? Yeah, yeah. yeah very good. Yeah. That Like, her performance was so good that I actually... I was sat there thinking, I fucking hate you. And I love Laura Dern. Like, I, she's one of those, like, actresses where I fucking fantasise about marrying her. Like there's something about it. She has such a... Like, Jurassic Park, uh, Wild at Heart. Like, she's just so... She's always in good movies. And she's one of those actresses I feel like you nearly forget she's a great actress. Yeah. Because of, like, the way certain movies she pops up in. But fucking great. And I watched his latest film. Um, that's also on Netflix. Because he's done a... Yeah, I haven't seen it. really want to see it. He's done a multi multi film deal with just Netflix yeah I think he's signed up for five I'm actually liking Netflix doing that because that is their like if you're a streaming giant your big selling point is that you don't need to make money in the individual film so you just go to directors and be like what is the dream project that no studio will make yeah yeah. because it just sounds like a, a way to burn money like the Irishman like, Martin Scorsese going around to studios saying, hey, can I make a four-hour fucking film about getting old, being a gangster and getting old? Like, no, you can't. That's going to be shit. I wonder shit. if anyone actually watched that, like, from start to finish in one city. I did. I watched it in the cinema. Fucking hell. I, I had like, to get up, like, ten times. Honestly, the only people that loved it were the ones that watched it in the cinema. Because I feel like that is a fi- like, that's not a film to break up. I know people were saying, like, I'll oh, pause it at this bit, and it's like a miniseries. But it's not because it was. That's like pausing a TV show every twenty minutes and walking out, like in the adverts, and then walking out for a day and then coming back. Like it's not. It's meant to be watched all in one go. Yeah, the thing is, I was at home and like, if there was a slight like downturn in it, I was like, I'm just gonna go and get a tea or something, and then I'd fuck around for ages. See, and there was no way of doing that. Yeah, exactly. No, see, it didn't even fit. But I like slow movies as well. Yeah, it's four hours. But yeah, no, Bambuk's got a multi film deal. Yeah, it. He didn't actually have the contract signed until after Marriage Story, because I don't think Netflix, on paper, the film would be their marriage is breaking up, they're going through a divorce. How depressing. But, obviously, they were brilliant in it. Every, all the cast, Scarlett Johansson, Adam Driver, uh, Laura Dern, and then it won all the Oscars, so... Mm. Netflix were like well, it's, the, it's the smarter way to go because when they went and made like hey Michael Bay what film do you want to make mm-hmm. it's like don't go and try and make the 100 150 million dollar films yeah find the quirky indie guys who yeah. can't make any money anyway and make those and make them for like one fifteenth of the budget yeah and they always have their little followers as well mm. they're like no no a bambook's new film like, yeah like, losers like us I yeah like, yeah yeah watch that i'll keep my netflix subscription and then i was watching um checking out a youtube video actually of the 10 upcoming films this year i can't remember all of them but i'm quite excited about this new fucking willy wonka musical starring old timothy chalamet oh uh, yeah should be quite good i don't I know anything about it but neither I kind do I. Of... Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. But do you know what? That is exactly what I'll be like up until watching it. Like my whole feeling is just kind of like, yeah, I'll watch that when it comes out. Not excited about it. Not not excited about it. And what I do need to watch actually, Declan, I still have not seen June. Oh, June. Yeah, watch June. Because June two's coming out, isn't it? Once again, in the category of, I'd say, what? Be prepared to watch it twice, and oh, be God. be okay with not necessarily loving it the first time. But it's like five hours long, isn't it? Nah, it's like two and a half, two twenty. What other trailers did you see at the cinema? Oh. I love trailers. I actually saw quite a few. I should have made a note of them. Shit, what did I see? What did I see? What did I see? There was quite a few there was one that looked shit. Fuck, I can't remember at all. That's why. Alright then. On that bomb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe.